Well, our first speaker today is John Sauer. Uh, as you know, John is a, he's a very accomplished ornamental, ornamental turner. I think his works speak for himself. You know, I can say a lot of stuff, you know, like John's handsome and debonair, but I'd be wasting my breath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John is here this morning to share a living history of his body of work entire to Turner's Road. And we're blessed to have John here, so let's give him a warm welcome. Can I put that in my pocket? You can put that wherever you want to. Put it right back. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been to most ornamental turning conferences that have been in the United States, and I've even went to England a couple of times. But uh, it's a hobby that I've enjoyed ever since I learned about ornamental turning. Uh, we're going to take you down a little road of what I've turned and how I've gotten to where I am today, share some of my work, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's take a look. Okay, this is my original lathe, and it was gifted to me from my grandfather. He made it. It's a couple of pillow blocks on some four by fours and angle iron. The centers didn't meet, but it was my learning tool to get to where I am today. I kept it for about 25 years and finally upgraded, but that was my first lathe. It has a little sanding disc on there now, and uh, it worked. This is one of my first pieces. It's made out of Douglas fir. If you notice, it's been glued up. It's fallen apart. I've glued it back together, but I still have it and I've had it for many years. Uh, it's in my showroom at home, my man cave. It's on the top, but I love it. And it's one of my original pieces. I found wood really hard to turn, so I switched over to turning wax. And I searched my old slides and found this one. And the two candles in the back were turned on the lathe. I started working wax because it's so easy to turn. You just touch the tool and you can carve with it. But that's the only one I found, and uh, I was really happy I found it. Uh, some of my first projects uh, are with exotic woods that I liked, uh, a few bowls. Uh, the center one up here is a light switch, a dimmer switch. Uh, put that on the wall, and every time you go in the room, you can touch it. Wood's nice to touch, has pretty grain. Did a few pens and a few little bowls, and I didn't like bowls, but there were too much to work make. I didn't like it. So, but the exotic wood I sure liked. Uh, I then switched over to making vases. And these are out of, the two on the right are Manzi, Manzanita burl. I fell in love with that wood. It was so, so grainy, and had the voids in it, except there's rocks and sand in it. And some friends of mine were importing it, so I had full access to get anything I want. The one on the left is uh, Cocobolo, which I like that wood too, but I'm kind of a little allergic to it. It's peppery smell, and I broke out like hives on my arm, so I didn't like Cocobolo. But the grain that nature made, I sure enjoyed the ornamentation of making vases. And these were a number one seller. I, I started doing uh, craft shows in the mid-70s, where I could buy a, a booth for 50 bucks on the street. And well, it, you set up your tables, but that's where I was selling these, and I also made a few other non-mentionable items that uh, kept me going. But it's fun. Enjoyed working on the lathe, making things. You sell it, you get rid of it, then you can make something new. And it's making a few bucks on the side. Uh, I've made a number of crosses. Uh, especially at Easter time and Christmas gifts, Easter eggs, and little bottles. Uh, those were natural edge over here. Uh, they were, people were making natural edge bowls, so I made natural edge bottles. These are stoppers that pull down a, a small vials inside. But I like making those, and the eggs were fun. You could give those away. You put a lot of them in a basket. So this is just plain turning. So I was learning and learning. And then I started learning how to do the chatter work, which is bumping a tool, and you can see the little marks on the lids. So I made my own tools, and I think Dennis Stewart was making one you could buy. And I didn't like his, so I made my own. 
and started making my little containers. And the exotic woods are very evident there. The colors are beautiful. I loved it. Uh, a few more turn bottles, they all open up. Uh, ones on the top are plain turning, and then the ones down below are a little bit fancier turning. Uh, some of them, the sides are sliced off. And here I put a little gold paint in the chatter work to make it look a little better. And that's a Coco Bolo one, which I don't know, I still like the wood, but it didn't like me. Um, these are bottles also that open up. Uh, this one here, it's articulated and it swings back and forth like a radar uh, thing. And, and, and it opens up right here. This one opens up right here. This bottle, it opens up here and right there, which you can see it taken apart. These bottles, I use an O-ring seal because it's forgiving. I didn't want to cut threads. A jam fit was too much. So if I put an O-ring in there, I can twist it on, twist it off, twist it on, twist it off. And if it gets a little tight, you put a little mineral oil or silicone on there, and it loosens it up. After a while, sometimes the rubber O-rings go bad. Uh, these are scent bottles, and it's kind of like giant yo-yos I was making. And then I would put a little medallion in the center that was chatter work. And these were jam fits. There's a little chatter work. And I was showing some of this to a guy by the name of Roger Davies in the SOT, and he said, you don't need an ornamental lathe. You're doing enough right now. But I, I, I did want an ornamental lathe, and we'll get to that. But here's some more chatter work on these bottles. And it's just bouncing the tool across. And then this one opens up right here, twist fits, and there's a little vial inside. And the same yo-yo effect, being round, this one I tipped over, elevated. And these are bottles also. I uh, started becoming a little bit more creative in my designs, experimenting, doing a little inlay work. Uh, the one in the center, they're butt, butted, butted together with the sapwood to create an eye. And I carved a few things. And this one here is relief and then it's turned little beads in of the beetle nut. I started using beetle nut. I love the grain in that, very nice. Uh, did a lot of scent bottles. These are similar to Stephen Paulson's bottles. Uh, he just passed away a few weeks ago uh, playing uh, bocce ball, poor, poor guy. I upgraded a better lathe. It was called a Power King. Um, I kept that up until uh, about eight months ago, I gave it to my cousin. I had two cousins, they both wanted it, they were fighting over it. I says, whoever gets here first can have it. But it was stored on the side of my house for 10 years or so. Um, spinning tops, I, 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 I like making tops and I still to this day love them because there's something you can make on a lathe and get a result in a relatively short amount of time and it's something you make and you can play with it, you can share it, you can have top contests, you can make them and just keep making them and keep making them. And I, I'm still making them and it's, I've been doing that for years and years. So I wanted to elevate the tops a little so I started making stands to hold them out of fancy exotic woods. And they sure help sell them and I, I like selling those. Uh, these are some little boxes I made. They're turned on the lathe and they have a bandsaw drawer cut into them. Uh, this one's a vertical one. This is cut separately, the bandsaw box, and then I put felt in it. They slide in and out. And then the face on the top, I put on the lathe and turned it to make a design. And did a little cut through on the tulip wood. You can see I cut through. This is uh, zebra and koa, uh, Pernambuco, and I don't recall what kind of wood that is. Probably rosewood of some type. Uh, on the bottle zone, I started doing spirals. Now these are hand carved, where I mapped it out ahead of time, and then I carved it, and then sanded it smooth, and then put a little chatter work up on this one. This one I cut out and did a spiral flame inside the lid. And they twisted, opened and closed. More on the spiraling. Uh, 
this one here, it's a, it's a rectangle one where it spirals around. And I got this idea from William Hunter, who was doing spiraling on his basis. He would map it out and do it. And so I started doing it similar to how he did it. And uh, my result. Some of my miniatures, you can see there's a, a nickel there. So you can get the idea of the candlesticks I made, little goblets, miniatures, little vases. The exotic woods add to it. Uh, this piece of pink ivory is unbelievable. And this is faulted maple and a little beetle nut and togwa nut. But miniatures are fun to make. They're easy to make, fun. But then I ran into this thing. It's a uh, fine woodworking magazine. It had an article about a, a fancy lathe. And if you read the article, there's no way you're going to get one. But uh, I started looking. I went to a lot of garage sales. And then I found some auctions that had some in them. But I never was able to get one in an auction. And then I get bought one in, uh, it was 86. I bought it sight unseen at Christie's at an auction. So I didn't know what I was bidding on. And I, I think I got it for about 1,400 pounds at the time. And then a few months later, it showed up, and this is what I got. Uh, and I was tickled pink. The bad thing about this is that when I opened the crate, I pulled on the board so hard, I whacked myself in the face. And I had a double-sized lip for a few days. But I was as excited as all hell because I got one of these lathes that, you know, I didn't know if I'd ever see one, but there it is. Um, this is what it looked like when it came out of the crate. It was a little grungy, dirty, oily, but nonetheless, it was a whole apple lathe, and I was happier than pig in what. Um, there's a picture of it on the left that came with it. There's a picture on the right after I put a couple hours in, probably, probably 60, <laughs> maybe more. I don't know, but uh, 2237, it's still in my shop. It looks a lot better now, even, uh, because I've cleaned it up. Uh, the kids liked it. These are our two daughters. They would go for a ride on the treadle, and they liked it. They'd hold on, go up and down, up and down. They loved it, you know, and so they had a new toy. Um, I soon quickly took a trip to England to learn more about this, and this is at the Science Museum in uh, the reserve collection in England, uh, Michael, um, Michael Wright, he's the gentleman there. Uh, I don't think he's still there, but he's still in England, but very knowledgeable about everything. He took us on a tour of some of the items that Holtz Apple made, or these are, well, the top, the left two are Holtz Apple. Most of the ones in the case are Holtz Apple. The one on the bottom is Holtz Apple, and I don't know about the two on the right. But uh, you see some of the stuff they made out of ivory. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't know how they did it, but it was all done on these lathes. And this is the type of tools you need for these lathes were all these little fancy cutters. Um, mine didn't come with them, but I managed to, to buy these. You know, over in the UK, they, they come available all the time. Um, they just uh, cost a lot of money. Uh, cutting frames, you need these cutting frames. These are some vintage ones that uh, I purchased over in the UK. And they all work very well, but the newer modern ones work even better. They have ball bearings, they have better cutters, they have carbide. You don't have to sit there and sharpen all the time. You can throw away your cutter or index it. Most of you are familiar with the little triangle cutters. They're great. That's basically all I use these days. I use Occasionally use a few others. So with this lathe, I started experimenting, doing index uh, carving here on the side and across the top. And then these are done with circle cutters called eccentric cutting frames. Some of my first boxes off this lathe. A lot of fun, a lot of time. Learning curve is monumental, but it's fun. And it was my hobby. I worked at the Postal Service during this time. I did uh, 37 years there, and I'm finally retired, but it's a hobby. It's a hobby for most of us. How many of us are going to really make money doing this all the time? 
pretty, it's pretty hard to do. Very few turners elevate to that level to make it their full income. These I faceted off. These are disc bottles like those first ones where I just faceted them off to make them. I'm doing the same item, just ornamenting it. And, and they, they were pretty good. I'll, I did a number of those. Uh, but then I started making boxes, and these are index carved on the Holtz apple. The one on the left is a spiral tapered cut. I like to taper things just slightly for the gentleness of your eye. The one on the right is a zigzagging effect, and those are all index carved one cut at a time. Now, if you do this on the Rose engine, you can speed up the process 10 times faster, maybe more. Uh, and once you do it on the Rose engine, it's really easy. But this on the Holtz app, a lot of time. Uh, the one on the left here, it's done with uh, a, a cutter with a cove on it, and it, it came out pretty good. The one on the right, I, uh, I made that one and didn't realize that I had a major boo-boo uh, on it. And I didn't realize it until I saw the picture. And I couldn't believe it. Uh, the stairway that goes down here, it goes tick, 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 and then I did a, a long draw, and then I went here, but right here, I overjumped one of the holes, and you see there's a big boo-boo right there. Uh, in other words, if it, it's not following the stairs just right, but I didn't realize it until I saw the picture. I don't know if I wasn't paying attention, or I don't know, but we all make mistakes, and sometimes we keep them, sometimes we don't. If I caught that one, I might have tried to correct it by going a little deeper. But I didn't realize it until it was done. Oh, well. Anyway, uh, ornamentation here on these bottles. The one on the left, I drilled all these little holes, and then I turned little itty-bitty dowels of blackwood and put them in, and I came in and ran a drill bit over it that made a little bead. And it took me two weeks to do that. And I said, there's got to be a quicker way. So I did this one, and I drilled all the holes, and I got some bamboo, bamboo skewers, and I cut them all and put little pieces in. And that was a lot faster. And I said, hell, I might as well just use some snake wood, and I don't have to do all that work. <laughs> so I went from really difficult to better to real easy. Um, spiral apparatus for the whole sample. It's a train of gears you hook up to the, the headstock, and you can do spirals. So, this is something I bought from a guy by the name of Paul Fletcher, who just recently passed away. He sold me this, and he says, well, you don't really need it. You can hook up a bicycle cable to do it and this and that. And I said, no, I want the real deal. So he sold me that. Uh, and when you hook it up to the lathe, it has a train of gears that comes out on a banjo arm. It collects, connects to the slide rest and then runs across. I think I have another picture of it. And then you can index it here to get the eight starts or six starts, or whatever you want to do. Uh, and here's it all hooked up. So I'm cutting a spiral here. That's probably 16 starts or eight, I'm not sure. But the spiral train of gears, and then you hang, turn the crank here, and it moves along and does the cut. And then the cutter spinning, running from the belt. Uh, very time consuming, very slow, but it gets done. This is its setup for doing reciprocating work, which rocks it a little bit. It's kind of nice to do. I do some of that. Here's a spiral I did on one of my miniature bases, but the spiral is only right in here. And then the three legs on this, it's one turning, and then I sliced it in three spots and ground it out so it has three legs. Uh, some of the spirals that I've done, these are some of my first ones. Really enjoyed them. The one in the center, it's done with a step drill. This is step drilled also, but I, I put a piece of Corian inside before I, and then I cut through so you have a, a white stripe inside. And then this one is done with the reciprocator with a step drill so I get a little zigzagging on there. And these have all contain a little glass vial inside. And then these are all done on the reciprocator, which it's a wavy line effect like on this one. And this is phasing it so you get it bumps. I call it a lizard cut. 
put a little piece of king wood here, and this is king wood, black wood, and beetle nut. And then I put a finial on there. I like making finials, but some of them are a little sharp and dangerous. Uh, 91, I got a rose engine. This is a, a plant. Uh, it's a very nice lathe for doing guilloche work. Really easy to work, quick, fast. My, it was my favorite. Uh, I just recently sold that, which it's used to make all the, the guilloche marks like these. You can see it as watches, watch cases, and Fabergé work. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the guilloche machine by now, a rose engine, I hope. So I started doing it on wood, used the machine, and it was working really good. It's new lines from my boxes. I put them across the top. Love doing it. The only problem I had with the rose engine, there's no really good book to tell you how to work that machine. The best way to work it is to learn by sitting there and playing. Playing. That's what I call myself as a player with my toys. My toys are my machines. But they're, f they're fun. You can do, this is on blackwood. It's very subtle, hard to see, but you can see it. In the box, it's got this, the ornamental spirals on there, but on the, the lid, it's got the guilloche work. It's hard to see on blackwood, but it's there. Uh, here's a few more boxes I did, uh, African blackwood, and it cuts pretty good as long as you get your cutter really sharp. More of my boxes, and those are a combination of the two. And then I started doing a little metal work, a little silver. Silver's fun to work with. Uh, it's nice. The problem I had with these is after a while, the, the, the silver kind of tarnished a little. So I was putting a finish on it, and that finish doesn't work sometimes. I paid somebody to do the uh, enamel work. I was not good at enamel. I bought a kiln. I tried it, took classes in it. I never mastered it. I said, that's for somebody else, so I quit doing that. The one on the left has some gold in it. Uh, I believe that piece is in Gorse collection. I guess his wife has it. I don't know if anybody's been to his place. Do you know if that's still there? Um, back to uh, nature with nature's ornamentation. It's a piece of shagreen, which is stingray skin. And it comes in every color of the rainbow. Uh, it's a leather. It's pretty easy to use. It's hard to cut. I use tin snips or aviation shears. Do not use a, a saw with it. And I started putting it in the lids of my boxes. Uh, and the combination of the black wood and the black shagreen and the beading, you sand it down to get that effect on the top where it has little like little white bumps. You sand it down a little. Here's uh, a different color. It's red. And it's put into one of my boxes on the lid and also on the bottom inside. I love the material. It's, it's got a nice feel to it. I have a wallet made out of it. There's somebody here showing me a belt the other day. They have a belt made out of it. Uh, I put it on the sides of boxes where I wrap it around. Uh, this one I made, and that's in the Arm Brewster collection. Um, blackwood and uh, shagreen. And I ornament all the way down into the bottom inside. You can see here's the bottom of the, and I put a little button in here carved into it so it fit in and on the inside of the lid there's a piece also and a piece of shagreen inside the lid. I tuck it down in. I really like this piece. Yes? I use contact cement. Contact, you, you put it on one piece and then you put it on the wood, let it dry and then you have the uh, uh, 90% chance of failure because if you don't put it on just right, it's stuck. It's, it's a dangerous glue, but it's, it's what uh, the, the people use on their shoes to put them together. It's not going to come apart, uh, but it works out really good. Um, I don't want to use any other type of glue because that works. You just have to really be patient, make sure you line it up, get it just right and get it in, and if it doesn't work, 
you're in trouble. Um, inspiration and ideas. Um, Mr. Uh, Walt, I wonder where he got his idea for that castle behind him. I think he might have got it from right here. But making my bottles and doing finials, I, I just look at any kind of book, or if you were a tra traveler, you can see all kinds of places that have beautiful work. Uh, page on the left is from Holtz Apples, uh, volume five. Some of his work in the castles, and that was my first castle on the right. So I tried to make something like that. It came out a little different. I was really happy it went into a prominent collector collection down in LA and he still has it and he paid a lot of money for it and you know, I was happy you know uh, so I started making castles uh, and it shows me doing a few cuts making one uh, your time consuming is all hell on the whole sample it's make a little cut make a little cut index and make a cut but I did do a few nice ones in the future. These, these came out of that. Um, and then I, I made three batches of about 10 each. And every time I made one, I made them a little different. I never did two the same. But I ended up doing about 30 of them. Um, and I haven't made one. I, I've gotten a lot of requests, but I won't do it. Uh, this is from a publication by the Society of Ornamental Turners, and it was about a guy by the name of J.E.H. Sauracker who did ornamental turning. Uh, he died at about 47, so he did these little farther after about the 20s, the 30s. Um, he said he never owned a rose engine, um, but he did, sort of. He had a regular lathe, and, and you can clearly see that some of these were made on a rose engine. I, I know some of these are rose engine. This is rose engine. Uh, this is a, a hollow ball on a ball. This is rose engine. This is rose engine. This is swash and rose engine. But what inspired me were all these little discs that he cut. And they were very unique. And I said, you know, that's something I really like. I'm gonna, I wanna make those, how did he do it? And I, and I couldn't figure it out and you know, I was very inspired by it. And this is some of his real work. They, they thought his work was destroyed, it wasn't. It's still out there. These are some actual nice pictures of his work. I, I have pretty much good, yes? Where are those from? They're in, um, Germany, the, there was an, uh, a showing of his work uh, last year, and I was very relent relentless with my emails, hitting the curator many, many times to get the images of what was there. And I have the full catalog. It was a fight to get them. And, uh, but I did get them, um, and, and I'll share them with you if you want. Um, these are some of his original discs, and he's, they're strapped into these metal brackets inside this case, and there's a little knob at the end. So this is one side of them, and this is the flip side. So there's, uh, there's two rows on each row, but those are the actual ones. Now, some of his rose engine turnings, now something like this, I haven't figured out how to do that. I, I still don't know. But this, I have pitch, other pictures of it, and it's built up. These are separate turnings. There's, there, there's little, if you can see right there, there's, it's where it's framed together. I have a, uh, some images of some of the frames that are in pieces, because some of these pieces were damaged, uh, and they, they put them back together. They hired a few people. This is some of his real work. Anyway, uh, this is the picture of his lathe that, that was out there. And he modified it. And I'll show you in a second. But this is, we look at it. It's, that's a regular 
lathe. It's a regular turning lathe. Um, but he made it into a, a, a rose engine in a different manner. And here's a picture of him at one end of the lathe, and it's obvious he's got a heart on there. And if you look at it um, right here, there's the rosette right behind it. And it's fixed tool. It's fixed tool. He's using a fixed tool, and he's cranking it in the lathe, and he cranks the cutter in and makes a little cut and does a little cut, a little cut, and gets deeper and deeper. This is some of his work here and up here. But how did he do it? Uh, now here, we can look at the lathe, and what he's done is he's extended the mandrel out a long way. And this is the spring here. And so this is, is wiggling out there like this. It's sticking out, and he can move this bracket down to all these little different spots for the length of how he wants to get it to swing. And there's the, where his, his pattern that he's cutting is, and his rosettes right behind here. And here's a few of his rosettes. And if we look at them, they have holes in them, which means he builds them up and clamps them on to create different, different types of patterns. So he's way out there. And he's not sharing this with anybody. If, if anybody in the SOT knows this, he did not share anything. And I got these images from that process of hitting on the museum curator's head. Um, here you can see some more of his work, but it, it's quite different than most Rose engines. And so I, I, that was one of the things I liked were these little discs. So these are some of the discs I've made in the last year. Uh, these were uh, ornaments that I gave away at Christmas time. And they were very small, very thin, do the pattern on them, and then I take gold paint and rub the gold paint in so they look very Christmassy. And then put a, a hook on the top and a little ribbon. Very nice gift. You know, you can make these, give them away. But I've been fascinated with making discs, and I make discs, and I make discs, and I make discs. And that's fun for me. It's not tops, but I, I have a collection of these discs that's beautiful. Back to tops. <laughs> Still making tops, mixing different woods, beetle nuts and colors and acrylics. These are tops that fit onto little paperweight stands. And some of them you can ornament, some of them you can't, because when you get woods that are very highly figured, you ruin it. You can't tell. Now this one is so figured, it's beautiful on its own. But on the bottom I put a little rose engine pattern. And the same with this one, it sticks through on the bottom. And it sits both ways, either up or down. And so they're little paperweights. I love making them. And I put them on the wall, a little top on the wall. John McGill has this puppy. <coughs> and that's in John's. And it's, uh, it's a spinning top that plugs in here. But this is reciprocated out. And you can kind of see it here. And then this is index carved. And then that's the receptacle for the, uh, the top. And it sits on the wall. It's wall art, functional wall art. I've done a number of them. I, there's another one. And it's, that's done, um, I think it's done under a uh, reciprocator. I think I did that on the, the side right here. And then I took a piece of book matched uh, maser birch and put it on there for wings. And the top sits up on the top. This is another one. But the only rose engine part is the receptacle for the top. And it's Kingwood book matched. Similar to the one John has. <coughs> and a few others. Uh, the only rose engine turning on this one was on the back of the, the frame where I did a, quite a pattern. And the rose engine work up here is on the tops. These are two spinning tops that lift off 
and a piece of book matched ebony with snake wood. And I think there's a little rose engine there. So I'm using the rose engine to accent stuff. Spinning tops, I'm always making these. I'm in and out on them. And I call some of these, these are parlor tops. And I got that idea from one of uh, Paul Fletcher's kaleidoscopes where he clicked it on, he called it a parlor scope. <coughs> So that's where I got that idea. We get our ideas from things we see, places we go. We borrow them and we change them or we steal them and copy and get better. Who knows? Um, some larger pull tops. Uh, these have engine turning on the faces, these. But other than that, they're just big pull tops. Some of the things I make and, make, and I'm still making today Here's that busy wood again where you don't want to ornament it, except I did on the bottom. And it's okay, but it still gets lost. It shouldn't have any ornamentation at all. So I started doing some uh, boxes, and I used the, the top as a lid. And it would sit on the box, either vertical, or it would turn over and go down in. And these are different views of the same box. And I go all the way in and cut on the inside of the bottom. So they're little top boxes. They're not functional for anything except to look at. And you got a top to play with. If you were at a desk, you could have it sitting like this. And while you're on the phone or the computer, you can play with it. Uh, more of the same process, just a little different rosette. I work with one rosette on it. And that rosette is the basis for the top and the box and the inside and the bottom. Sometimes I flip flop and use a couple of different rosettes to make it even better. Um, one of my favorites is the blackwood, boxwood, bamboo, and beetle nut. I've made about 10 or 15 of these. It's a good seller. We do craft shows, we'll see you. This one, the inspiration for this was uh, uh, Alien Movie. And it showed, I have that one here. It has a, a ceramic bearing for the tip on the top, and it sits either way, this way or that way. And it's one rosette. I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, FRG6, I think. I think that's it. But somebody was talking to me about right of center and left of center. Well, here's the process where I had to go off the back side of the rosette and cutting on the left side. Uh, spinning tops, uh, I just posted this one. It's a little basket I made, little, held a dozen of them vertical or this way, and they tucked in. A little chatter work on there, I'm still playing, doing these. But then I do ornamental tops too. And so I will do the the carving on the tops and that has, some of them have copper, and this is copper, and this is gold paint. It's a tester's paint from the model making, nothing special. These were uh, a fidget spinner, and it shows both sides of it. It's got a, a ceramic bearing here and there, and a little spinner, and you could grab it, it has put like a tire tread on the side. And that was a, that's a really nice one. A little spinning top. Has chatter work on the top, the face of the top, that's blood wood up here and there. But then I've done a little ornamental turning right here and right there. And then I've cut a little slit in here so you can kind of see through it. There's a little ornamental turning here and a little rose engine patterning here. So I use the rose engine to accent, put little accents around. It's really nice. Uh, this one here, also from the Alien movie, I got the idea to do it. And it's a little top and it plugs in. And there it shows it's spinning right here. It plugs in. I have that one in the showroom. And the, the beetle nuts here and here are loose, they're little beads, and you can spin them. Uh, another ornamental top, this is uh, a lot of different woods together. I've made two like this, they're really nice. 
a lot of work, probably a week in there, off and on. So you gotta remember I'm working full time someplace, and playing on the lathe to get away from reality. It's me, the lathe, and wood. Uh, it's one of my, uh, I call it a tower uh, top. There's a little rose engine on it. Uh, there's the rose engine down in here and up in here. And the top sits either way. It turns over and plugs in this way. So you can show it any way you want. And here's some close-ups of it. Here's where it's the F4, and it actually locks in here. And here's it spinning. And there's a little button underneath it. And there's a lot of detail with the F4 up in here. So I use the F4 rosette all the way through it. But it's fun. More tops, colored, exotic woods, beautiful. They spin good. I sell well. I'm on Facebook uh, accounts of top collectors, and I do very well selling them. Uh, well, I was doing a show, and somebody said, you should make buttons. I said, buttons? Really? Yeah, you'll do good. So I started making buttons. And so the, the ones on the top, basic buttons, and then I do some ornamental ones, and uh, I did button conventions. I started doing them. They sold very well because there's a lot of people who collect buttons. You'd be surprised. Um, so I offered a different type of button that they, did, they didn't see before, and I started doing them. Uh, the ones on the left all have shagreen in them, which I tuck it in, and then some of them have an additional piece turned on the same rosette, and then I put it in the center. That's natural, this is natural. And these are uh, guilloche on uh, Corian, and then I use a magic marker like a Sharpie and put it on there and then sand it off to cr so you can see the effect. But the buttons, fun to make, easy to make, and here I am making those patterns again that are small and easy to make. I'm not making anything big, I'm just making patterns. And I have a lot of fun, and these are offsets and squares and rectangles. They sell. People like them, they're different. Uh, patterns on, on the lathe, There's, I'm just still experimenting, playing. There they are. Fun to make, easy to make, quick. Color, polymer clay. I added these to a lot of my buttons. The canes you can buy on Etsy, you cut them in like cutting a piece of pie, I mean a slice of bread, you bake it in the oven for 30 minutes, then you turn it, and then you can put it in. I did an article in uh, David's newsletter and it told how to do it. But it's fun to make, it's more up my alley of making something small, something easy, something relatively quick, nothing too complicated. But then again, you can get really complicated with what you're going to make in buttons. Uh, these are all buttons or pins, different multi-layers, very nice, fun. Uh, there's a fancy one up here with polymer clay that a, a lady in Kansas makes, and I put that in there. But the multi-layering, fun to do, easy to do. These are a little bit more complicated where the, the, these are the buttons and the, the lid unscrews and inside there's diamonds, uh, probably minor glass, so fancy, cubicles, cub cubics, I mean. Um, but they are smuggler buttons and they sold very well. Uh, these are pendants. They're very nice. I, I just finished making these. Uh, these are buttons, but they're back to where I started. They're light dimmer switches. Uh, so push on, push off, and they turn. Uh, the one on the right is a very large one. Uh, the button people like these because it's a button for the wall. They can, they can touch it all the time, and they can admire it. So it's like a giant button. Uh, oh, there's my wife, Sharon. Uh, this is at a button show. Now, when you do a button show, you can put everything in one little case and walk in, lay it out on a table. It, it's not like doing a regular craft show, but 
There it is. You can. It's like a, a pop-up show. Uh, there's another view of it, and here you've got buttons, uh, some dimmer switches. These are hair picks, some bottles, buttons, and pendants. I can have my whole show in one little box. It's kind of nice. Uh, played around making rings. They're fun to make. You can give them away. I like turning the beetle nuts. You have to put some a lot of super glue in them to hold them together. None of them are waterproof. Uh, this is one of my shows, one of my booths. That's uh, one of the types of booths we've run. Uh, this is the more comfortable booth where you walk in there and it was very comfortable. Uh, and it's nice, the, the decor is very smooth and it has a nice rug. But the problem is, is people like the booth but they didn't buy my work. But it was nice. I, I thought it was showed very well. It was beautiful. I liked the booth. But I only did this booth twice, and then I trashed it because this one sells better for some reason. And there we are again, doing another show. Uh, and I did a show a few months ago. I don't do many at all anymore. A uh, combination of a, a box done mainly on the Rose engine. It's nice with the beetle nut and bamboo. And the bamboo, this patterning, oops, go back, go back. The patterning here, that's where the knuckle is in a piece of bamboo. So you can only get that pattern in that one little area. So I'll buy bamboo and I'll cut it up looking for the best one and throw away all the, the rest of it. So. But you, there's different types of bamboo. There's a little uh, box I did some time back, all done on the Rose engine, totally Rose engine. It was fun to do. I, I, call, I can't remember what I called it, but and I sold it. That's what I do, it's I make something, sell it. Gives me an idea to make something else. Uh, this is a, a little bamboo box, and it's basically a sleeve of the bamboo, and that's all. Um, th this is the sleeve, and it's cut through, and I put a bottom in. I plugged it in on li after I turned it, and then I cut a little scalloping on the outside and then made the fit like that. But it's nothing more than a piece of bamboo. Um, a little zigzagging on this, it um, was Madagascar rosewood and tagua nut. It's a nice pattern. Never did it again, though, but it was fun to do. One of my best pieces I made was a bracelet box that came apart uh, the bracelet was held in the center. You pulled the lid off, and the bracelet would come off, and then it was hollowed out and fit really nice together. And the rings fit on the finial. And there, were, uh, there's, there was a pendant that went inside, but it wasn't photographed. And here I am with these little patterns going around on the bracelet. Very nice piece. I sold it. Oh, well. <laughs> Ring boxes. Uh, Two of our kids recently were married, so I made them a ring box for presentation at, at the wedding. And this is one of them. Uh, I don't remember. No, this was our daughter's. Yeah. Yeah. So then on the bottom, I inscribed, you know, the date and all that when they get married. Uh, a little box. Uh, it's done pumping on the sides and a tagua nut pumping for the finial right here and then I put the paint in, the gold paint in. This is inside the box in the bottom and inside the lid. Fun box to make. Uh, more polymer clay. I did this one a few years ago. Uh, I made this one after um, my, I had some surgery and I couldn't really work well, so I made this one and it took two months to cut it. I, was, I did probably 10 minutes at a time, but it took two months to make uh, and it was a nice piece. Uh, a cubicle box, which is nothing more than patterns uh, from the Rose engine, done on a square piece of wood, uh, different pattern on each side, and I put one of my buttons in to match it, cut off the same rosette, on all four sides and on the lid, 
and there's the bottom and inside of the lid. And it had a taper of eight degree fit. Like I, that's how the best fit, Gorse told me. Eight degrees, you can't go wrong. And you don't, eight degrees. Uh, this is one I just uh, let go up in Portland at the AAW was auctioned off. Uh, it was a taper fit of eight degrees. It was all done on the Rose engine. It took about a week to make that one part time. But it was a fun box. Uh, this is a reversing lid box, which I just made. And if you take the lid off and you turn it over, this is the underside of the lid. So the lid has this on the top and this on the inside. So you can put the lid on either way. And then this is the bottom of the box and the inside. It's a cute little box. And Dave called it the kitty rosette. It looks like a little kitty, he said. Uh, this is part of my equipment. That's my main lathe that I use now. It's, a, it's an old Delta Rockwell. It's been good to me. I paid about 400 bucks for it. It's been good to me. It's made me a lot of money. Um, you can see some of my samples up there. Those are Rose Engine samples. I have a lot of samples. Uh, I have a machine lathe that's a, uh, an Emco. I use it occasionally for doing some nice work. A uh, little inspiration around there. Uh, picture of some old stuff. Picture my kids on a, on a, a roller coaster. A nice little Rose engine and an old one there. And my good buddy, Jack Daniel. Uh, this is what my Holtz Apple looks like now. I, I changed it a little. It has a different slide on it. It has an Evans, which is powered by this motor here. And the cutting frame is driven by this one. And if you notice, I have a lot of lights here and here. Light, as I'm getting older, I need a lot of light, especially on the Blackwoods. It's, it's hard for me to see, um, but I have these little um, lights. I buy them from China, $25. You buy them from Mr. Wonderful, and he charges you 150. Nine watts is what I use. So those are the ones you want to look for, the nine watts. Uh, this is one of my lathes. It's the Erbschla Musterman. Um, it's been good to me. This is the Arm Brewster Mark I. Very good to me. And it's, uh, I call it the Playmate of the Month. I look at her every day, though. Um, static Guard. I use this to keep down the dust on a lot of my, my uh, somebody was cutting, you, you were cutting the plastic. And uh, this stuff here I use for my wood because it gets all stuck up everywhere. So I spray it ahead of time, sometimes during the process. I use it all the time. Uh, some of the finishes I use, um, the black tile polish. Brian Jackson showed me that. Thank you, Brian. It's great stuff. Uh, the red tile polish. That uh, there was a, a Richard Lynch floss turned me onto that. Called it a pink ivory enhancer. I remember I used to sell it, yeah, but uh, it works great on tulip wood and pink ivory. Uh, it helps it. Uh, the black tile polish, great on Blackwood. Uh, you have to buy those in the UK. It's not available here. You might find it on a website or maybe even eBay. It might cost you more to ship it than it does to buy. But in the red polish, I don't know if that Cardinal's available. You can try that. Um, some of my finishes, the Kiwi Wood, uh, Kiwi Clear ne Neutral, that's Paul Fletcher's taught me that one. Use that, and it works great. I use the shoe brushes. I use clear wood finish, uh, deft. I use semi-gloss. You can get it in satin or extra gloss. It's up to you what you want on your work. But I use that on just about everything. Uh, fine little areas on your ornamental turns. I use electric toothbrush. My wife says, this toothbrush is not good. Throw it away. I said, oh, I use this. There I am using it. And it gets in the little cracks and crannies and cleans it out. 
And you can see it's well used because it's nice and dirty. But it, it saves you a little bit of work. Uh, my buffing system is Carnuba Wax with buffing wheels. I have a few different wheels. Works good. Uh, one of my highlights, I was the first American to win this award from the Society of Ornamental Turners. And then the president gave me the, the nice little plaque and I shrunk it down. But they spelt my name wrong and I just didn't complain. I just said, just take it. It's a John, just spelt different. But those are some of the pieces that I won it with. So it's one of my highlights in my career. Uh, some of the magazines I've been in, some of the magazines are no longer around and the, some of the galleries are gone. But nonetheless, it's an accomplishment of where I've been and that's a reward for me. To see your name in print, to see your work in print is satisfying and that's all that matters. It's a plateau. I've reached my plateau, it's all downhill now because I'm getting <laughs> older. Um, this is one of my pieces that's in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Once you get a piece in a museum of art, it's there forever because it's never gonna see the light of day and nobody will ever see it. That's the problem with museums. Uh, that's somewhere down there. I'm in about six or seven or eight museums now and I was fortunate to get in there through various people who helped me. And this one is in the best museum in America and I'm proud to have it there. And this is what I make most of. And you know what that is? Chips. That's what I do. And that's it. Thank you.